Axe likes this very much. Welcome to Coffee with Coffee, 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 Coffee. Let's do this! Good evening and welcome back to a new episode of Coffee with Toffees. Guys, should be a pretty good one on the books here as we get this thing started. My name's Toffees as always. You can find me at Toffees underscore Dota 2. And it's been a little tough to find me lately because it's been very busy, but I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight. So uh, remember, the show is brought to you by our sponsors, Razor, the maker of the finest peripherals in esports, and of course, betway.com uh, where you can place real money on esports and show off your knowledge as well as make some money off of it uh, great site great place to put your bets in and uh, one of the few that i actually trust so if you do want to go to that you can link at it below the fold and uh, supporting them helps support uh, me because you know they're, they're a sponsor so yeah uh, they keep small content creators keeping content coming out so that's it our plan for tonight is we are going to talk first about esl uh, i was unable to watch a ton of it because i was in the moving process but i did go back over watch the replays at the highlights um, as well as I had a PL proxy a writer for join Dota help me put together a good summary so that if you were stuck at the office or you weren't able to watch the entire event we can kind of talk a little bit about how it went uh, which it went very very well it was very successful in a lot of ways and a lot of folks really talking about uh, it setting the bar in terms of quality for a event of this size. And a lot of people uh, had some worries, myself included, about things like, uh, for instance, the host, who a lot of us knew of from other games, but hadn't really seen do anything in the Dota world. And uh, absolutely showed beyond the shadow of a doubt that he knew what he was doing. Uh, the interviews were strong, in my opinion. So there was a lot of great things that I think we saw from ESL that really stood out but we'll get into all of that uh first let's talk about the tournament itself and uh sort of the standards that it set, or as well as who came out ahead so the event for those of you who might have missed it uh was a fairly simple format it started out with seating matches they were played in a best of one double elimination format top three starting st the top three teams to come out of the seating bracket were allowed to pick their opponents for the first round of the main event fourth is obviously seated against each other so it made for an interesting dynamic of the first round where the best team got to pick who they thought the worst team was so on and so forth a lot of teams seem like they did not enjoy this um there's a lot of talk and back and forth on twitter about the seating matches not going smoothly um uh, this wasn't at the esl event but it was done in a land format uh, so I can't really speak to that. I haven't spoken with a lot of players about it, uh, other than that there was some frustration during the seeding phase. Once the seeding ended, however, from what I understand, the players became much happier with the tournament at the live event. There were some complaints, but after it ended, the complaints sort of dissipated. So that usually makes me think uh, maybe it wasn't as bad as the initial offering was. So as far as the main event went, it was a single elimination best of three format. So once you're out, you are done. In the first round of the tournament, VG and C9, they looked a lot weaker, in my opinion, than most people would expect. Uh, VG got very convincingly, is probably the best way to put it, 2 0 by EG. Uh, while C9 had a kind of a shaky games and lost to IG. Now, quick talk, and we talked about the Chinese Shuffle once upon a time. Uh, VG has proven to be a very strong team in the past. They dropped 2-0 to EG, which if you remember the summit, the similar thing happened as they were knocked out of the tournament by them as well. So VG Gaming, not by any means a top bad team because of the fact that they were knocked out so early. They were knocked out of knocked out by one of the other top three teams that they're often included in that bracket with so they i think were deceivingly had a deceivingly bad showing that said eg taking them out 2-0 uh i think should be worrisome for bg pg gaming they came out in the fourth seed uh which means they weren't the worst because they weren't picked by one of the top three to go against they were a middle of the road team and uh to lose that badly i think it raises some red flags they need to prepare themselves for TI. That said, this is the last big event, by the way, before TI, so we're going to see all these teams go to boot camp, um, and we'll see a lot of them come out of that boot camp, I think, better for it. So it's curious to see which teams get the most out of the next month leading into TI. The prize pool is 
500,000 away from being 15 million. So this is going to be a big event that everyone is going to be on their best game for. Now, the games in the grand finals uh, were really good. If you haven't watched them and you just say, hey, what should I watch from ESL? The grand final series was great. While EG did lose 3-1 in the series, the games were not complete blowouts. They were fairly interesting to watch. The early phases of the game especially, uh, very, very good. EG, I will say this, looked like the only team in the tournament who had the ability to take out Secret. Secret has become a leviathan, for lack of a better description, in this Dota 2 series and is making some really great plays, showing how powerful they are, uh, showing the power of independent players who can self-fund coming together in this capacity. And I will say that EG, if anybody can stop them, I think that that onus will lie with Evil Geniuses going into TI. They've got the best chance of it, or so it looked like when watching the series. Uh, Seager will remain the favorite for TI, I'm pretty sure. Uh, like we said, they do show a lot of potential, and if any team can work hard enough, and I don't say this just because I'm a fan of uh, some of the players on EG, but if any team has the work ethic to close that gap, it is going to be Evil Geniuses. If you've seen their camp, I've been to their camp before, uh, they sit down and they work very hard when they have a goal, and I expect them to do the same thing. So what I did do, though, is I put together a, uh, I want to show a quick finale, so if you are watching uh, live, you'll see a re-video of the final, uh, one of the fights that really determined uh, the end of the series, and if you are on the podcast, you will be able to hear it firsthand, uh, though you probably will not be able to see it. If you want to see the clip, it is from Noob from UA, get over to the YouTube channel and check it out. So we'll flip over to that. And uh, here we go. This is the last big fight that resulted in Secret taking home their fourth LAN win in a row. Worth of experience deficit, and now it's on TZ. He's the one protected by the Lotus Ult. They bring down the tier 3 tower, and they found Fiona! He's in trouble! DVD with a start, let's give him out! University push! And as you push him up, they lock him out! Universe is in! Popping eye up in the air, and Koro stops the fun! Holds the fun! With the song of the siren, they're waiting to come back in. They're up on the high ground with Fiona, and they got him! He's down! 106 seconds! Universe in trouble! This could be it! They need more control, they need more damage. EG's backing up, they need more people. They've only got two players alive. And it is gonna be one hell of an effort if EG can do it. There's your Thunder God's Wrath. Refresh Robs available. Go for number two. And that's Bloodseeker down. S4, not in a healthy position either. BKB is protecting him, but they have to retreat out. The buyback comes in from Arteezy. Round They're two. going for round two with PPD up in the air. He gets the echo slam on Arteezy, but it will not save his life. No yes, buyback. Yes, GG! Yes, yes. Shikaru will take the victory. Denying EG another PSL1 title. Then taking another big victory for Team Secret on land. So a great win for Team Secret, really showing why they are the masters of what it is they do. I also want to say a great cover by uh, Toby. That was classic Toby. The hype, the pauses between the hype, um, really doing what he is known best for, which is bringing the fun to... Uh, to the event, and I, I think it was funny to watch that a lot of folks, uh, actually there's a post on Reddit about why isn't Cinderin or Merlini on the co-cast, they're more experienced as an analyst, I think we forget that Cap is a strong analyst, they have really great charisma together, Cap and Toby, and I think that having a team that works together a lot, that knows each other very well, is very important, especially in a grand final like this. You heard the crowd going wild. They got caught up in the hype. My favorite part of that whole fight is uh, when Cap, the only thing he says in the entire thing is you hear him in his deep Cap voice go, round two. And I think that that's hilarious. Uh, and it really sums up how well they work together in a good flow. So keep up the good work, guys. I think that they did a great job. And yes, I think Cinderin would have been great on the analysis, but when you get to this stage in this masterful of a team, EG versus Secret, you know, when I watch a grand final, I don't want to get the nuts and bolts. I got that the entire tournament. I want to get excited. I want to watch this thing, and I want to see stuff blow up, and that's exactly what was delivered in the grand final. Now, as we said again, man, this is the fourth in a row. Team Secret, a veritable juggernaut, has been stomping through every tournament that they have come in contact with. They take home $120,000 uh, off of this win. Evil Geniuses get $60,000. Virtus Pro and Invictus each get thirty, dollars and then everybody else splits up a fifteen or gets a $15,000 paycheck for being there in the first place. But Team Secret seems unstoppable. Now, let's talk about behind the scenes. 
up to the end of the tournament, there were some complaints coming out of players about seating matches, organization, uh, uh, travel, accommodations. There was a comment that the practice rooms were not good enough. They weren't ready when everybody arrived. Um, however, once ESL really got up and running after day two or so, I started to see those tweets taper off. And it seems like after the fact, most players are saying that they had a positive experience. I don't know if that's 100% the way it went. That's just the feeling that I get. Um, if you are a player, if you do want to confirm that and say, yes, ESL was a great event, please feel free to tweet at me um, and we'll talk about it on the next show. But it does seem like it was very, very smooth. Interesting stuff that came out of it. If you guys uh, want to, you can head over uh, to join Dota. There's a couple of articles on there. One of them is uh, by Proxy PL and he talks, it's an interview that Malastrix did with Kuroki and uh, he mentions in it that he is writing a book about uh, esports his parents uh, and the interactions he had with both growing up. It should be pretty interesting. Apparently, it's a side project that he's working on and a pretty good interview. So head over there and check that out. We're not going to run it right now because we don't have time, but it is a good interview uh, by Malastrix article by Proxy PL. So make sure you check that out. Now, the other thing I want to mention, and this is a tough one for me to a certain extent, and I'll show you why, is... Uh, and I'll tell you why, is I want to talk about the host. Now, a lot of folks were skeptical when they heard that the host uh, was going to be, like I said, someone who didn't traditionally know Dota. His name is William Chubra Cho. Chubra Cho. I, uh, again, I didn't get to watch the thing live. I had to go back and watch the replays because I was house shopping during this time period. Uh, we saw 16 houses in a day. I'll tell you all about that at the end of the show. It was crazy. Um, but I went back and I watched, specifically because I host and I interview it. So this is something that's important to me. Red Eye is a, is a really great example of a good host, and I think that losing him, a lot of us were worried what will happen with the quality. Um, and I'm going to say this. I'm going to say as a fan and a Dota lover, I was really impressed with Chobra. He clearly did his research. He understood the game of Dota enough to transition uh, discussions. He masterfully resummed a lot of things that were said. So an analyst would come up with a really great idea uh, or say something that maybe was a little bit highbrow. Nahaz is a great example of this. Uh, would come out with some really great stuff, maybe a little bit long or perhaps a little bit intense. And Chobra would do a really good job of not only keeping the conversation flowing, but restating what the analyst said in a very simple way and then posing that restatement as a question to another analyst. And what this did is created a really smooth panel and a comfortable vibe. He also could run the camera when nobody, when there was nothing to talk about. I really, really respected what he did. And now I'm going to say that this is a huge compliment for me because I wanted him to do terrible. Not on a personal basis. I think Chopra's a really great guy. But as somebody who dreams of being a host and possibly getting a spot on that ESL bench one day, I was like, man, I hope that this proves that you have to get a Dota, Dota loyal uh, to host these sorts of events. And Chopra Cobra proved me wrong. He proved that the red eye seed has been filled and was doing a wonderful job with it. So kudos to you, Chobra, as someone who loved watching Dota 2 uh, and thinks that we need to work hard to take it to the next level. You 100% carried the torch from Red Eye, and uh, I was incredibly happy. As much as it made me professionally go, ah, what am I going to do now? Uh, I was really happy to see how well you did. So kudos to that. All right, so uh, now that I have given the props to Chobra, I will say that the interviews on the event were pretty good. Um, I think that there is still a little bit of work that could be done there, but I liked how they did some good fan interaction, uh, put the interviewers in the stands, tried to engage the people who were there. ESL had all kinds of fun events going on at the same time, from uh, cosplay to bull riding to a balloon guy who apparently became the star of the show. It sounds like ESL has really started to put their heads around the idea. Uh, they've adopted that X Games model, the the. the not X Games Dota, but X Games uh, Extreme Sports. The idea that when you're selling a sport that isn't that popular, by making it a festival and an experience, it contributes to the growth of the event and draws a lot of people in. And I think that they did that well, and I look forward to seeing what ESL has for us in the future. ESL New York is going to be a good one. So uh, that's that's my wrap-up on ESL1 Frankfurt. If you're thinking, what should I go watch? Should I check it out? Absolutely. Go watch the Grand Finals. And you know what? Don't just watch the games. Go to the Twitch channel, watch the previous broadcast, and check out the awesome amount of production value that ESL brought to the game. It felt like I was watching a big event. It felt like I was watching a sports coverage, and I, and I really feel like I got um, what we deserve to get. So kudos to you, ESL. You did a great job. Now, Next topic at hand, this one does need to be talked about because it's kind of all over the tabloids and the papers and everything else right now. And that is what's going on with, with the North American Rejects player, Korok. 
A lot of us knew that there was some personal issues and some things that came up prior to the NA qualifiers. Not a lot of us knew exact details of that. They worked hard to make sure that uh, everything was squared away. And it has come out in, a nor in an NA Dota post on a forum uh, two days ago that what happened was Korok was arrested and uh, uh, charged with a crime with battery and then released on bail. That was put on this forum post and sort of from there things just spiraled into a crazy out of control uh monster for lack of a better word so what i want to do is i want to talk about the facts that we know and i want to talk about the dangers of overhype and i want to talk about uh this gozu article that a lot of folks were talking about today that kicked up one hell of a storm now the fact of the matter is this we know from reports that were found and published that yes, Korok was charged. We don't know if he's guilty or not guilty. And I will remind you that this is America and you are considered innocent until proven otherwise. We know that the team, uh, Greg, has said that everyone who is relevant to the discussion has been informed and kept abreast of the situation. And we know that Korok has chosen not to make a comment. Now, on a side note, as a grown ass person who understands a lot a little bit, the fact of the, that nobody, and a lot of folks have said, why haven't we made a statement? Why isn't PR? Why hasn't somebody sort of nipped this in the butt? When there's an ongoing legal issue, the best thing to do is just not talk about it to a certain extent. Uh, and I think that they made that right choice. Let those who need to know know. If you need, I don't think that Dota is a big enough thing. There's not 20 million people tuning into every single game where you have to create PR announcements to save your organization. We're not really there at this point that said it is important to remember that dota is growing that there are hundreds of thousands of fans out there and when something like this does happen people are going to be interested they are going to call it news because it did happen that said uh i will bring up the fact that we have had a couple of different things come out alone uh korok's girlfriend tweeted that she's been with korok for almost a year and reading so many speculations rumors and bad intention threads is just awful so she's been with him for a year and she says uh that the seeing the speculation and rumors and stuff has been really really frustrating and I think that that says a lot that she was able to tweet that out, that maybe the situation isn't what has been posted and talked about on threads. And we should maybe take on a second of a, a critical eye and not maybe jump to pitchforks right away. Now, the thing that we do want to bring up is the Gozu article. And I'll pull it up on the screen for you guys. It has changed a lot today. Uh, the original post was a lot more, I will say clickbaity, uh, aggressive. The original article said that uh, Korok was convicted of a, of malicious assault, not charged with malicious bodily injury, uh, which was wrong. He has not been uh, convicted of anything. He has been charged. And they did add later on a district court memo that has the charges intact, states the defense attorney, all of the fun stuff that, you know, is real life. Now, let's go into a sidebar where we talk for just a second about whether or not this article was okay because in reddit in a lot of different places also on reddit they're saying yes the article is good give us more drama no big surprise there a lot of tweets have gone out today from different members of the community saying this is all tabloid this doesn't deserve to be published nothing has been proven true or false yet um it shouldn't be out there so here's where i stand and you can take this or leave it with a grain of salt but here's the point it is news that a major player in the north american dota scene one of the top two teams in North America has been charged with a crime. And not just a crime, but a serious one. Um, as somebody whose family, not my direct, not my, uh, perf my main family, but my mother's family, was affected by things like domestic violence, I do take these things seriously. And it is something that, you know, in the same way that everybody covered the Ray Rice incident and other sports when it happens, it's something that does deserve to be reported. That said, it deserves to be reported the right way. And the way that Gozu published it, the way the article was written, was very, very misleading. Uh, sorry, top three, e.g. Uh, complexity and North American rejects. So I, I did misspeak. They're one of the top three North American teams, not top two. I guess you could argue that they're top two, uh, depending on if you are on their team or if you're on complexity. That's it deserves to be reported with fact. And now that they've put the general district court notice on the Gozu article, that they have more sources than just a North American Dota post and a uh, Twitter message from his girlfriend, that's a little more logical to me. But it is very important, I think, and uh, understated the responsibility of 
these websites to stop being the first to publish, and we've talked about this before, and start doing their due diligence. If you want to be called a new site, you have to have facts, and that's the, that's the nature of the game. That said, I do believe that it should be reported. I won't argue that, uh, but I also think that we need to be careful not to jump to any conclusions, especially with something like this. I have seen uh, how accusations unfounded and spun out of control can ruin people's lives. I used to work as a teacher and I actually had a guidance counselor when I was a kid uh, who was accused of wrongful doing by a student in the school and the entire district jumped to conclusions. It was found out a month later that the uh, student made up everything but by the time that that happened, the career was over. He had already moved to another state, um, and the teacher had been run out of town in every worst way possible and having done nothing wrong. So it is important, I think, to stress uh, being careful. However, if it does come out and he is found guilty and it is true, that is newsworthy, and it is something where then you have to wonder, what will Valve do? Will someone take action? But at the end of the day... That is not a discussion that needs to be had until we find out what actually went down. So um, we'll leave it at that. You have the facts. You know what has been published. Um, keep in mind, if you go to the article, you're going to see right next to each other because Gozu has done a good job, admittedly, of adjusting their article throughout the day. You will find a list of the actual case details, but you also find the tweet from his girlfriend who says that she is hurt by all these speculations that are coming out. So... Until we know more, we're going to leave it at that. And I will say, because of the fact that we do do news on this show, and I wanted to make sure that I covered everything, um, I did reach out to the manager, I did reach out to the team, and I did also reach out to uh, Korok's lawyers and ask if there was an official comment on the situation. The official comment from North American Rejects, as well as the legal team, is no comment whatsoever. So we're going to leave it at that until we know more, and I will obviously keep us abreast of it as we go forward. So those are the details on the Korok situation. Uh, for those of you who wanted to know about it, I think you needed to, uh, but I want to make sure that we keep it very, very honest and open as far as this dialogue goes. Now, last thing we're going to do before we log out is uh, you guys may be wondering, where have I been? What has been going on? Uh, about a week and a half ago, my wife got a new job offer. I ex am excited about it. We decided to go ahead and take it and relocate our family all the way to Indiana across the country. Uh, so we will be doing that. And that has been sort of why we've been all over the place. In fact, I was in Indiana last weekend. Uh, and luckily for my family, we've been saving up to get ourselves the home that we really wanted to raise my son in. They would have space for a studio. Uh, we went to Indiana this weekend and looked at 16 houses in a day. And after a whirlwind tour, managed to actually find the house that we were in love with um, and purchased. So as of the inspection, the final stuff going through, we will own the home. I will have a space for my studio and uh, we're going to wrap the show up tonight. I'm going to give you a nice slideshow of uh, the actual house for those of you who uh, care to watch that. So if you guys are on the podcast, yeah, you will not be able to see the pictures. I head over to Twitch, head over to YouTube and check it out. If you are uh, a fan of the show for the news, but not all that interested in uh, Toffee's story, you're more than welcome to head out now. But I am really excited about this house and what we can do with it. So I'm going to show you the slideshow of the new place uh, and let you see just how cool it is. Also, by the way, the slideshow was made by my father. It's a video um, and it's kind of hilarious because he added this like weird music to it. So <laughs> we're going to we're going to have that up in just a second. All right, here you go with the terrible music, but this is the house that my wife and I uh, were just able to save up and get.
All right, so that's the place. Uh, I'm excited about it. It's got a nice big basement where we can do all kinds of production stuff and uh, really, really excited about what it should bring to the show. But that said, guys, that's the episode for tonight. I hope you got the information that you need. And like I said, the next month will be interesting. I'm going to come on when I get some interviews. We'll do the weekly recap. But all the all the teams are going to boot camp, so there's not a ton of news that we expect to see. Uh, however, I can uh, tell you for sure that when the, when the news drops, Tacos will make sure that he brings it to you. That's it, guys. Thanks for watching. Have a great night. And as always, Toppy's out.